Hi, this is Michael King. Today we're going to talk about the weighted average cost of capital. Here's the formula for the weighted average cost of capital. As you can see, it includes debt, preferred shares, and common equity, where the cost of each is what it will cost the company going forwards to issue new debt, new preferred, and new equity. By weighted average, we mean that each of those costs is going to be weighted in their proportion to the company's capital structure using their market values. So let's look a little more closely at the components of this formula. You can see that we're using K to refer to cost, where the subscript D is for debt, P is for preferred, and E is for common equity. The cost is going to be in percent. Cost of debt is going to be adjusted for taxes. Later we'll explain that this is because of the benefit of tax yields. Both preferred and common are not tax adjusted because dividends are not paid until taxes have already been paid. The weights are going to be based on the percentage or proportion of debt, preferred, and equity in the capital structure, where the capital structure is simply the sum of those three components. Most importantly, notice that the weights are going to be based on market values and not on their historical or their book values. So the weighted average cost of capital is really the minimum return that investors are going to require to hold the company's securities. People have lots of options when they want to invest their savings. They could put it in government bonds, which are risk-free. They could buy real estate, such as their homes, other assets, such as gold, or perhaps hold it in foreign currencies. So from the perspective of the company, what is a cost is, from the point of view of an investor, the return that they expect. So when you look at the cost of debt to a company, it is simply the return or the yield to maturity that investors require in order to hold their bonds. When it comes to preferred shares, it's obviously related to the dividend that is being paid on those preferred shares relative to the price which gives you the dividend yield or the return. And for the cost of equity, we're looking at how much will the shares appreciate in the future and how much will the, com will the company pay as dividends. In other words, what will be the total return on holding the company's shares? The WAC, it's used in several different ways. For example, the treasurer or CFO may evaluate projects using the WAC as the hurdle rate for judging whether to make an investment or not. We know that when looking at capital expenditures, we want to look at the returns relative to their upfront cost. We want to approve projects that have a positive net present value. Similarly, if you're an investor or a financial analyst who's valuing a company, you're going to forecast the future cash flows to the firm and discount them at a given rate, which is going to be the WAC. This is your standard discounted cash flow model. Those free cash flows represent cash available to pay to all security holders or all capital providers, debt or equity of the firm. So a DCF model ultimately is going to allow us to back out the intrinsic value of the company's shares based on what we expect to be the future cash flows. There are four steps to calculating the weighted average cost of capital. Step one, evaluate the firm's capital structure and decide on what weights to use for the different sources of capital, debt, preferred, and equity. Given that many firms do not have preferred, this formula shows that preferred is zero and we're only focusing on debt and equity. We need to know the relative amounts of each using their market values. Step two, estimate the cost of each source of capital. By cost, we mean the market rate that investors are expecting to receive for holding those securities. Step three, adjust the cost of debt using the marginal tax rate. The marginal tax rate is the rate that is expected to be paid by the company over the long term in the future. It is not the historical or the effective rate. Step four, simply plug those inputs into your formula and you will get your weighted average cost of capital. Let's work through an example. Here you can see a company has only debt and equity. The cost of debt is 6%, which is the yield to maturity on its long-term bonds. The expected cost of equity is 9.5%. The company pays a 35% marginal tax rate and in terms of market values, they have 30 million of debt and 70 million of equity for a total capitalization of 100 million. Plugging these numbers into our formula, we see that the cost of debt 
that 6% is going to be reduced by 1 minus the tax rate. We're going to multiply that by 30 over 100, or 30%. The cost of equity of 9.5% is going to be multiplied by 70 over 100, or 70%. Adding it up, we get a weighted average cost of capital of 7.82%. Now think about that for a moment. The upper bound is 9.5% if the company was entirely financed with equity. 7.82% is below that. The cost of debt is 6%, but after adjusting for taxes, is more like 4.5%. 7.8% is roughly 30% towards the cost of debt at 4.5%, and 70% towards the cost of equity at 9.5%. So it makes sense that it's somewhere in between those two costs. Which weights should we actually use in the capital structure? Do we use the company's actual weights, or do we use their target weights? You always should try and use the company's target capital structure, which is the company's expected capital structure in the future. The past may not be a good reflection of what's expected in the future. How do we determine the target capital structure? Well, it's not easy. You could ask the treasurer or the CFO on an earnings call and see if they'll give you an answer. Likely they will not. They may, however, talk about a target credit rating that they have in mind, which is an indirect way of saying what they expect their debt to equity to be. You could always look at their historical capital structure, because this may be indicative of what capital structure they've been targeting in the past. You could also look at what the capital structure is of comparable firms in the same industry. Firms in the same industry tend to have similar capitalization, the similar amount of debt relative to equity. You could also look at plans the company may have to issue equity or to issue debt in the future, which may signal that they're moving to a new capital structure. The capital structure that you choose is going to determine the weights, and it is an assumption. What items do we include in the capital structure? For example, we're only looking at debt. Do we include other liabilities, either current or long-term? What if they have capital leases? We want to focus on interest-bearing debt, not other liabilities. If there are items on the balance sheet that looks like debt, such as capital leases, you can include them in total debt when calculating the weights. You do not want to incur current liabilities, which we'll talk about in a moment. You also don't want to incur include other long-term or non-current liabilities, which may be shown on the balance sheet. Are you going to use the book value or the market value for those weights? The answer is always the market value if possible. Market values are forward-looking, whereas book values are historical and backward-looking. We want to make sure that we're looking at the future. If the market value is not available for the debt, you could substitute with the book value of debt, assuming that the debt will be maturing at par. This is not a bad assumption and one that analysts often use. If the company has no traded securities, you're going to have to come up with an estimate of what the market values are, probably by looking at traded comparables or by getting an evaluation done by an analyst. The next step is to figure out the cost of debt. We figure out the cost of debt by looking at bonds traded by the company in financial markets. We're looking at the yield to maturity on those bonds which is the current yield that's expected if you were to purchase it today and hold it to maturity. We do not look at the historical coupon or interest rate on the bond because that reflects a past cost of debt. Given that interest rates change continuously and the credit spread for a company may also change reflecting changes in its uh, riskiness, we always want to look at where the market anticipates new bonds would be issued. Of course, if the company does not have any bonds outstanding, you're going to have to estimate a yield to maturity for the bonds by looking at comparables or the bonds of peer companies. Notice that the, the yield to maturity represents a risk-free rate plus a credit spread. That credit spread is the premium for the risk of default. You can go and look on Bloomberg or potentially to other sources to find what the yield to maturity are on securities with different maturities and different credit ratings. Here, this data from October 2018 shows yields from one year to 30 years for U.S. Treasuries, which would be AAA rated, single A rated bonds, triple B rated bonds, and double B rated bonds. 
Notice that as you go from left to right, from one year to 30 years, the yield increases. But as you go from top to bottom, from triple A to double B, the yield also increases. If your company is triple B rated, you would look at the 30 year rate looking for its cost of debt. Why do we look at the 30 year rate and not the 10 year rate? Well, we're trying to forecast the value of the company in perpetuity, which means the longest maturity possible. Of course, if there is no 30 year bond available, you may be stuck and have to use a 10 year bond. But you would not want to use a 5 year or a 1 year bond because the rates will be too low. Always look for the longest maturity available. The cost of preferred is going to be backed out by looking at where preferred shares are trading relative to the dividend that is associated with those preferred shares. Just like a, a common stock, a preferred has a price that is quoted and available through a Bloomberg or another service. You would look at the dividend for that preferred divided by its current price to figure out what the yield is on that preferred share. This formula will look familiar to you because it is the price of a non-growing perpetuity. If the preferred share outstanding is not a perpetuity, you cannot use this formula to value it. If the company has several classes of preferred shares, you may not know what to do. The best suggestion is to ask for help. The cost of equity is going to be the hardest input into your WAC formula. Equity holders do not have a guarantee of a return that they will receive. It's an expectation based on what they think will happen to the share price and what dividends they anticipate receiving. The way that we're going to calculate the cost of equity is using the capital asset pricing model. As you can see, it's made up of three parts. There is a risk-free rate, there is a beta, and there is an equity risk premium. The risk-free rate is the current long-term benchmark yield on a government bond. So, for example, you might look at the yield on a 30-year U.S. government bond if your company is pricing in the U.S., or a long maturity bond in Canada in the Canadian dollar if your company is Canadian. Beta is a measure of the stock's undiversifiable risk or market risk, and it's going to be provided by a service such as Barra and Associates, Yahoo Finance, or you're going to have to calculate yourself. The equity risk premium is a premium for holding stocks over bonds and being exposed to both the volatility of stocks as well as the risk of default. For North American companies, the equity risk premium is usually 4 to 6 percent. The equity risk premium is sometimes written as the market risk premium, or you may see it represented as return on the market minus the risk-free rate. This is a confusing terminology, however, because what we're looking at is a long-term expected difference between the market and free rates. We're not looking for the current risk free rate. Some analysts will actually add a size premium which may not be reflected in the company if we're using the beta. In this case you would simply add 1 or 2 percent to the estimated cost of equity based on the CAPM. If the CAPM tells you it is 8 percent you could simply add 2 percent and come up with a, with a cost of equity of 10%. The risk-free rate is going to be found by looking at the yields on benchmark government bonds of long maturity. We want to choose a long maturity bond because we're valuing the company in perpetuity. We need to be comparing securities with similar features because investors always have a choice where they put their money. Beta, it is a premium that is estimated by running a regression of the securities returns on the market returns. Beta is going to be the slope of a fitted line from the stock returns on the market returns. The equity risk premium is the premium for holding a risky stock over a risk-free security. Sometimes it's called the market risk premium. For Canada and the United States it's typically four to six percent. But if you're looking at countries outside of North America, there are historical measures based on long-run studies of the returns for stocks over bonds. So, if you're looking at Central and South America, you may be using a, an equity risk premium of around 8%. And if you're looking in uh, Europe, it may be more like 6.5%. Step 3. Adjust the cost of debt for taxes. This adjustment reflects that interest expense is paid 
prior to paying taxes. Effectively, the government is subsidizing the cost of the debt to the company by allowing them to repay lower taxes. Notice that we do not adjust the cost of equity or the cost of preferred because dividends are paid out of after-tax income. You may be wondering which tax rate to use. You're always going to use the marginal rate, which is the rate that the company is expected to pay in the future for the next 30 years. You may look and see that their effective rate has been lower. That's because many companies are finding ways to reduce taxes in the short run. And so we want to be conservative and look at what is going to happen in the future, not as what has happened in the past. Step four, now you simply use the formula. Let's take a look at an example. Let's assume that a company is financed with 200 million of debt, 100 million of preferred, and 700 million of common. These are all market values. As you can see, the company has a capitalization of $1 billion. 20% is debt, 10% is preferred, and 70% is common. Those are the weights. The cost of debt is 10%, the cost of preferred is 12, and the cost of equity is 15. Debt is the least risky security issued by the company, whereas equity is the most risky. Preferred is a hybrid security with some features of debt and some features of equity. It makes sense that its risk is in between debt and equity, and that as a result, its return is in between debt and equity. The marginal tax rate in this case is 35%. Plugging those numbers into this formula, we see that the cost is 13%. Now ask yourself, does this make sense? Look at the after-tax costs under column B. The cost of debt adjusted for taxes is 6.5%. Cost of preferred is 12, and the cost of equity is 15. So we know that the weighted average cost of capital is going to be between 6.5 and 15. Remember that this company has largely financed itself with equity, which means the number is going to be closer to 15% than to 6.5%. Not surprisingly, the WAC turns out to be 13%. That's it. Just remember, the WAC is forward-looking based on market weights using the marginal tax rate. Use the formula and you won't go wrong.